Uh, welcome everybody to uh, this week's uh, Revis webinar series. Um, we have a very special session today. Uh, we've got an invited speaker, Carlo Berletta from Heidelberg University. I'm going to introduce him uh, properly in a minute. Uh, just before that, uh, a little bit of housekeeping, of course. Uh, so uh, by default, everyone is muted, uh, but if you have any questions, you should be able to find the questions pane in your um, Go to webinar toolbar. There's also a chat panel in which you're welcome to, draw, to uh, post any questions or comments. And uh, we'll be keeping an eye out on those uh, throughout. There will be uh, a couple of questions and answer session, uh, uh, slots specifically for um, anybody to ask questions throughout. Uh, so if you, uh, if you if you if something comes up, just put it in the chat panel, and we'll look at it when the these times come. Um, but uh, without further ado, I wanted to just uh, introduce our panel for today. So I'm David Wiles. I'm an application specialist for Revis. Um, and you, if you've uh, watched these webinar series uh, already, you're probably bored of my voice by now. But hopefully not so much that you've decided not to attend anymore. Um, our special invited speaker today is Carlo Bretta. Also with us, we have uh, Delisa Garcia. Oh, enough, I've mixed up the photos for Delisa and Tamara. I'm appallingly bad at this, and I profusely apologize. And Mauricio Abate also on the panel with me. Um, and we'll try and keep an eye out on your questions and answer if you have anything. Um, but uh, just uh, without that, I just wanted to introduce Carlo. So Carlo is a value image analyst and microscopy specialist. He works for the Department of Anatomy and Cell Biology and the Institute of Pharmacology at Heidelberg University. He's been working at the university for the last five years uh, to help scientists get the most out of the image analysis. Um, and he's been doing that using both commercial and open source software. Uh, today, Carlo is going to be introducing us to uh, some of the work he's been doing um, both in terms of uh, enhancing images using machine learning uh, and also tracking of uh, features um, using our VR software. And so without much further ado, I'm going to pass over to Carlo and uh, leave it to him for now. So Carlo, you have present privileges and you can start now. Okay, uh, thanks you, David. Can you see my screen? Just to be sure that I'm... Yes. Really perfect, great. Okay, let's start. Um, thanks a lot, David, for the very kind introduction. Um, my name is uh, Carlo, as David mentioned, and I'm working as a bioimage analysis and microscopy specialist at uh, Heidelberg University for the Department of Pharmaco oh, sorry, for Anatomy and Cell Biology and the Institute of Pharmacology. Um, what I would like to show you today is basically how we combine uh, different tools uh, that not only include a revis, but they include something else to basically be able to uh, do tracking in uh, uh, virtual reality. And as you will see, what we are interesting to track are very, very tiny protrusion. That means we need somehow to process this data uh, in, uh, in a way that we can visualize very clearly uh, this structure in virtual reality. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Now, uh, the outlook of the talk would be the following one. Uh, I will speak a little bit about the biology behind. We are interested in uh, following neuronal stem cell protrusion dynamics. I will not go too much in the biology because I think you are here to uh, see how uh, we do that and we come to the conclusion of track this protrusion and understand this dynamic in virtual reality. Um, what we use is a true photon in vivo imaging of this specific uh, uh, cell type in living mice brain. And what we want to have as a prerequisite is low phototoxicity and higher temporary solution. Now, um, most of the talk will be about the bioimage analysis workflow and the steps that we have in there just to introduce to you our enhancement or image restoration using uh, some deep learning uh, method. And I will talk about this enhanced AI developed by Nikon. Uh, 
Uh, I will then go through the machine learning operator with the live demo in Arivis Vision 4D. And as a last part, I will show you basically how we can then do uh, manual tracking in uh, Vision VR. Now for the Vision VR part, I recorded a demo, uh, not because I don't like to do it, but it, uh, basically because it's much simple to do it uh, um, by web seminar with a recorded demo. But if someone is very interested in having a live demo, I could also try that. And I think we will see according also to the time and how many people they are uh, willing to see me in live VR. Uh, at the end, also, I will do a summary and uh, show you some additional material for certain tool that I will go on to present. Uh, now, as David mentioned in the introduction, uh, we have two parts uh, where we have questions. One will be roughly at the middle of the talk and the last will be at the end. And there we could also have a, a longer discussion uh, um, about uh, the steps and the workflow. Now, uh, about the biological background, uh, we are interested in these neuronals themselves in uh, adults. And as I said, what we want to do is uh, be able to follow a very tiny protrusion, as you can see in the right side of the screen. These are this little tiny protrusion. It's a very short time lapse in this case. Um, and you are looking at the maximum intensity projection. And what we want to do is be able to follow that using a very low phototoxicity and higher temporary solution. Why we want to do that? Because we are interested in neuronal reparation and in disease, and these cells are very important also after injury. They are important for cancer formation and metastasis, and also for aging. Now, how we can uh, come up with a workflow that allows us to follow these dynamics and to do some quantification over time? Uh, well, as I said, the prerequisite is that we want to have this with uh, low phototoxicity and basically a very um, a high temporary solution. And the microscopy workflow is pretty simple. We have a mouse with a window, and this mouse is expressing a certain trust gene. Now, what we have is the life of the mouse here, as you can see from this line, and what we are interested in are in some specific windows. That means we want to acquire in this specific window or in this or in this during the brain development, uh, Z stack time lapse uh, to be able then in the end to quantify this uh, um, uh, um, protrusion dynamics. This project is a project that has been created by uh, Varun Ramani. It has been fun to work with him and he has uh, a lot of en enthusiasm for that. And uh, we, we decide and we construct this workflow together. Now, how looks basically one of our time points? Let's say now how we uh, can acquire that stack time lapse in a specific uh, moment of the brain development with uh, low phototoxicity and uh, um, higher temporary efficiency. Well, one of the problem if you want to keep phototoxicity with a temporary solution is that uh, the image look very bad. Now we try different setting and we try to acquire that stack over time. But if we want to keep uh, this as a prerequisite, our images they look very very pur poorly in terms of signal to noise ratio, and we cannot really distinguish very well structures. Now, ideally, what we would like to have are images like this, where we can see details, and in particular, we can see tiny protrusion in there, and also where we can see, as you can uh, see from this uh, screenshot, very nicely these little tiny details in the image. Now, uh, if we will do that for the entire time series, we will have a problem because we will induce phototoxicity and we could not keep, or we cannot keep higher temporal resolution. Now, uh, Ideally, what we could do is to acquire very nice images at the time zero, then start our time lapse Z stack with low uh, quality image. I call it here eye scanning frequency. That means we scan the sample very fast to have a higher temporal resolution. And then maybe at the end of our time lapse, we could acquire a low scanning frequency Z stack, as you can see from here, to have a nice image. But now comes the question, how we can transfer the information that we have for the low scanning frequency in our high scanning frequency images? Well, there are many tools to do that, or very few tools, let's say. One that's been published a few years ago, it's the CARE system from the Thorian Youth Lab. That is a very, very nice method. In our uh, case, we use the Enhanced AI developed by Nikon. And this 
Both are systems that they allowed you to restore your image and they are based on neural network. Now, how does it work? What is the principle? I mean, the idea is that we can acquire one Z stack at the beginning uh, with a, a low scanning frequency and we could acquire another uh, um, image or another Z stack with higher scanning frequency. Now, this will be our ground through and it will be our uh, raw data that we want to restore. Basically, we can throw that in a neural network, we train our model, and we generate our model here. And then simply, we could apply our model that we generate we using the Enhanced AI on all our time series. That means what we do, applying the Enhanced AI model, we restore the information uh, in the images. And we switch from these very, um, let's say, low quality images to images that shows exactly what we want to see. And I will give you uh, um, uh, some proof in the next slide. Now, on the left side, you see the raw time series, top view. This is a time lapse. I will start it in a second. On the right side, you see the output of this enhanced AI, basically the restored image. I'm suggesting you to look at the bottom panel because it's a, a higher magnification and you can see much better the details in the image. Up here, it's more confusing. It's more a kind of overview. But as you can see, as soon as I start the time lapse, in this data, we can see very nicely our image. And also, we have less, less noise in the data. One of the problems that you can immediately realize from the Im image is that we have some issue in terms of background over the time. We have some very big fluctuation that they appear in the data over some time points. Uh, that means the next problem that we found is how we can normalize this intensity, how we can reduce the foreground and even more enhance uh, the structure that we are interested in tracking in virtual reality later on. Well, what we can use is machine learning. Machine learning pixel classification method can be used to identify different, um, um, let's say, characteristic or different, can highlight different properties in the images. And how does it work? work basically by designing classes and using pixel feature and user annotation. I think this will get much clearer uh, as soon as I start with a live demo, or at least I show you something. Now, the machine learning operator in Arivis Vision 4D, uh, we can use it now to separate, this is the idea behind, the foreground pixel from the background pixel. That means we can define two classes. One class will be uh, trained by the user and by the pixel features that they are nothing less than uh, filters uh, to be a background. The other class will be trained to be, or to be part of the foreground. And the idea for that is to lower the fluctuation in the pixel intensity between the different time points. And as I already said, additionally enhance this protrusion. Now, just to make the point clear, we don't do the machine learning on uh, the raw data, but we apply the machine learning on the enhanced AI output. It's like a step in between the enhanced AI to restore our data. Now, which is the workflow? And I have just a small time uh, movie that shows you how it works, but we will do a demo later on. Basically, from the Enhance AI, we get an ND2 file. This ND2 file can be loaded directly in Vision 4D. Now you are looking at the Vision 4D. What I'm trying to do here is to train my machine learning operator to identify two classes. One class is called background, and the other class is called foreground. And as you can see, as soon as I draw this, uh, the number of labels or annotation that the user is, da, uh, is doing is increasing. I need to do this for a couple of more labels. And of course, uh, you need to do uh, a little bit longer if you want to achieve uh, very nice uh, results and very nice quality. But if you are patient enough, uh, we will see in a couple of seconds uh, the output of the machine learning just after a few rounds of training. And what we will have a look in a few seconds, it's what is called the probability map. That means we will want to see the probability map of those pixels that are belonging to the class foreground or to the class background. Of course, I'm not interested in the class background too much. I will just look at the or show here uh, the um, foreground class. That means about this tiny protrusion. Now you run it, you left the live update, show your prediction in yellow, as you can see from the data. And even after just few training, you can see how nicer is this probability map and how the background is reduced already in the data. Uh, 
now to give a proof of principle, uh, these are the normal. These are normalized. They are the normalized in ancient time series. With normalize, I mean that the intensity value displayed between these two data are equal. They are the same. The range of the value. And on the left side, you have an NCI time series, and on the right side, you have the output of the machine learning uh, performed on the NCI as an input. Now, if I run that, you see immediately that our background fluctuations are reduced, and most important, what we can see also, it's much nicer uh, protrusion in the data. Another interesting point is that I don't want to fake anything is that in the data, the information are there. It's just that we needed to enhance much, much more the range of value to display to see this structure in the enhanced AI. And of course, working with the machine learning, it will help us to visualize this tiny projection and track them in virtual reality. Now, in summary, uh, the um, um, in answer AI, uh, or in summary, what we achieve until now is that we can image uh, uh, in vivo with low phototoxicity and higher temporal resolution uh, using a restoration method. Uh, the machine learning operator, what does uh, and what allows us to do is to highlight the structure of interest. That's a very important point. Normalize the background uh, along the time series. And of course, something that you have to keep in mind when you try to do something in VR, reduce the number of foreground voxels that you render there. Of course, if you have a very crowded environment in VR, uh, it gets much slower. Uh, you, you have more difficulties in process the data. That means less things you have to render around you, much easier it's the interaction with the data in a virtual reality environment. Now, here we have a first uh, uh, short uh, part of question. Um, um, David, do we have any any question that I should uh, answer right now, or we just keep them for later? Uh, Are I still I muted? <laughs> so uh, currently, there's no question. Uh, okay. But uh, maybe if anybody wants to uh, pipe up, then now's the time. I guess not. So uh, if you want to okay. carry on. Yes, I will continue with the live demo. Maybe there will be more questions after that. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, now the idea is exactly to give you a live demo of the steps that I just apply. Here I just record this movie, but we will not look at this. That means I just now um, go out from my PowerPoint. I just minimize that. And I will start Arivis uh, Vision 4D. Uh, to show you how this machine learning operator works. I'm using Vision 4D 3.2. That should be the last release. Now let's maximize this. Of course, I already prepare a project uh, where I basically import uh, uh, the Enhanced AI images. And is this one. I can just drag and drop this one here. And here we have our images. As you can see, and this is the output of uh, the NCI that means our, our restored data. Now, for the training part, usually I prefer personally to change for the grayscale. And maybe also something that you want to keep in mind is to change the range of value that you want to display. This may help. Now, if I want to open the uh, training part, I have to go on analysis and I can choose the machine learning trainer. I just click there and here we go. Let's have a look at what we have in the machine learning trainer. First of all, we have the type of training that we are performing. Now, for the purposes of today, I will just rename it as a, a web seminar, maybe something like that. Now, here you see the channels. Of course, in this case, we have one channel, but you could include in your training multiple channel. And here it's what are these pix pixel features. Now. In Arivis, it's quite nice because there is already a suggestion for you, or it's kind of easy to identify which feature you would use. Now we have fluorescent data. I would say we could use this as a, a pre-selective feature. That means Arivis Vision 4D already will select the most important features to highlight structure in fluorescence images. But of course, if you have different type of data, you can choose other features. And if you want to play around or you are expert in that sense, you can just go for custom. And if you click in here, 
you will see exactly what type of feature we have. Features that can be 2D and 3D, and features, as I said, they are just filters. As you can see here, we have intensity, edges, texture, and orientation. And if you go down here, you have size. Now, let's imagine you want to try to blur your image uh, with a Gaussian blur. What you have in there to choose is the sigma. And this is just basically how the uh, feature works. And you can also have a look at that. Now, more I go down, more the value increase, and more the image is blurred. I hope it makes sense. Now, because I already, sorry, because I already tried, I will go for the uh, fluorescence and the M robust features. And down here, I have the background class and the class one or foreground class. Now here you have the painter. Of course, you can have many classes depending on the question that you have uh, behind. And you can choose the brusher to draw um, um, or to label the image. And of course, if you do mistake up here, you have uh, an erase to uh, delete your label. One of the nice things about the brusher is that uh, if you zoom in the data, the brusher itself, it becomes smaller. That means it's kind of helpful if you want to quickly try to train your data in a very fast way. You don't need each time to resize it according to the structure, but it resize by itself going in, zooming in and zooming out, basically. Now I do just some few training here, just to show you how it works. And what I'm doing currently is the training on time point one and on a specific Z position. Uh, my suggestion is always usually uh, try to train most of, or not most, um, some 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 or different Z position in the Z stack and not just one single time point, but maybe more than one single time point. Now I just add a little bit more in terms of background. Let me just, uh, I don't want to waste too much of your time seeing me drawing labels in here. Okay, let's imagine that we train enough. Okay, and here you see how many labels we have out for the background and how many labels for the foreground. What we can do now is look at the probability. And the probability of the class that I'm interested in is the probability of the class one, that means of the foreground. foreground. Now it goes, okay. Is updating okay I need still more training that means I can just simply go off and then proceed in adding more labels for the background class then I push again the probability button and you will see how this will get better and better you see that now we start to see much nicer our projection. Of course, we have still some problem with the background. That means if I would do it for myself, I will train for some uh, time until I reach uh, a point where the training is uh, representing what I uh, um, want to see in the data. That means what I'm thinking is uh, my foreground. In this case, this little tiny uh, um, protrusion. Something that it's also nice to use it is the uncertainty button. And this shows you what the classifier or the machine learning operator is still not understanding. And you see here, for instance, you could say, okay, I need to train a little bit more there. That means I can just switch here, add more background for this specific part. Maybe also here we can consider kind of background. And then I can switch back to the class one and go for the probability. And the probability, usually it's a, it's a number, can be in a 16-bit range, in a 32-bit range, in 8-bit range. That means it's a range of value. It's like an, an image, a clear image that you can threshold afterwards. If you go for the results, in this case, what you will obtain is a binary image. That means they will be just 0 and 1 or 0 and 255. They are not range in, of values in between. It's already threshold. And preferentially, I go for the probability because I can choose better methods afterwards than a simple thresholding to then uh, be able to segment the data or to convert this image in a label image. Uh, the opacity here gives the opacity of your label, basically, or the prediction of the label. And you have also the option to smooth and to choose your thresholding. 
Now, let's say that we are kind of happy about the training. I say, it's not perfect. We should train a little bit more. We should also look at the other Z plane, but I don't want to take you too much in here. What we can do if the training is strong enough, it's apply the training on the entire image set or even batch process. And how you do that? Well, simply I just close this one. I go for the analysis panel. And up here, most probably you're already familiar with, if you are using Vision 4D, you can choose what you want to process. In this case, I would say one image set. Which channel? Do you want to have some downsampling? No, we don't. And what I need to pick up, it's the machine learning operator. And it, this, it will generate a probability. And I will do that. The training is already in there. That means it's already chosen. The channel is the right one. I don't want to have a label image, but as I said, I want the probability for the class of interest. Uh, the label image will be like, if you have a nuclei in an image, each nuclei will have a different color uh, after segmentation and means we are, will have a unique ID. And what I have also to specify is how I want to have my output. I don't want to have as a temporary document, but I can have my output as a new image set and maybe a uh, web seminar or machine learning. And we say, okay. Now, if you would like to run this pipeline, you will just go up here and run the entire pipeline. Um, it will take a couple of hours. I guess on these uh, 25, uh, I guess our time point, and I don't remember exactly how many Z plane, uh, 72 and 26 time points, uh, it's up there. Uh, we take like two hours and I, I know we don't need to wait two hours. What I have, it's already a project where I run that. I just go for the new viewer here and I will import this project for you. Um, here we go. I'm loading now the project. I just want to split the view maybe like this. As you can see here, I add many, many more labels in the image and also along all, all some of the time point and also in Z. I just click on that and I want to show now the output. I just rescale it. And now this is the output of the machine learning. That means this, what we are looking at right now is the probability map as a 16 bit image, as you can see from the range of the value up, up here. Now let's synchronize the viewer because it's a little bit easier. And you see how nice it is. And also if I go by time, I can see that the background fluctuation that we had before now are reduced or in some case they are completely gone. That means using this approach, we can enhance additionally our structures and moreover uh, we can reduce the background and now we can work on this uh, uh, probability map uh, uh, in the tracking with virtual reality let's go back to the talk i think this two we just did it up here also this one okay now um Arivis, uh machine learning operator it's a uh, relative new um, and it's pixel based as I already said uh, it's mm, some years that I'm working with uh, pixels based classification uh, methods and one of my favorite tools uh, um, that I basically use very very frequently is a software that is called Elastic. Elastic it's open source and in Elastic, Elastic it's very specific for machine learning. You have many, many pipelines that include pixel classification, object, object classification, tracking with learning. You have many, many tools based on machine learning in there. Uh, but this workflow that is in there and works like in Arivis, it's the pixel classification workflow. Uh, if you are interested about this software, as I said, it's an open source software, you can just uh, click on this link and here you will find an explanation about the workflow and just going here you could download the software for your specific uh, operating system and you can have different type of version in there now um, the nice things that you can do in Arivis is to be able to import uh, um, the um, pixel classification project uh, directly in your workflow in this case, you will not do uh, the machine learning in Arivis, but we will we'll just be able to uh, put in your analysis pipeline the project that you have trained before in Elastic. 
And there are some reasons why maybe uh, you want to use Elastic for this specific purpose. One reason can be that maybe you don't have access uh, to a Vision for the license close to you. Maybe you have to go to the car facility um, and you don't have the time and you want to do it directly in the lab. Um, uh, and I think this is one of the main reasons why uh, I, I like to use it. And also the other uh, reason is that uh, you could also potentially run it on your laptop if you have a little bit of uh, RAM. Doesn't need GPU, that means you can keep your powerful GPU machine for Vision 4D and just do your training that is basically adding labels on your small PC in the lab or even at home considering our days. Um, how it works, and here I have a, basically a, a small video that shows this in a demo. You open your analysis pipeline as we did before. You choose where you want to apply that. And then you go down here and you choose the machine learning. Basically, it's the same that we have done before. The only difference here is that instead to uh, have done a training in there, you will choose your Elastic project. And here I already trained it in Elastic. If you look at the documentation, it become very clear. Now I can ex export the probability for the foreground class. And basically I can run this pipeline as we have done before. And again, here you have to choose how you want to have it. It can also be a new channel. I found sometimes very useful instead to have a new image set, uh, a new channel. And in this case, you can keep your raw data or enhanced data next to each other. So as a two channels or three channels image, depends as I said, from the purposes. Now this should be done, and of course you can run it if you want. Oops, sorry, I apologize for that. Okay, um, coming to the tracking in a uh, Revis Vision um, VR. I mean, the steps are uh, pretty simple. I don't know how many of you are already familiar with Vision VR, uh, but in there the tracking is uh, very easy to do it on this very, very tiny uh, projection. And the steps are pretty simple. What we will see is that we switch from Vision 4D to Vision VR. We can select the 4D render. We wear our Oculus Rift. We take our joystick. We choose the proper model for tracking. This you will see in a second. And after that, we track the structure of interest. And this basically it's what uh, one of the students did is a crop ROI XY of our um, data set that I showed you before. And you see how many tracks we were able to do it. And this costs really a couple of minutes. That means you are very fast and you are also very accurate. The other nice part is that as soon as you have track enough structures, you can just simply switch back to Vision 4D and there do further analysis in Vision 4D or simply export your tracks as an Excel table coordinate, speed, displacements, length, and do your uh, post-processing analysis in your favorite tool that can be Prism, that can be Python, that can be MATLAB, uh, R or Excel, anything that uh, is your favorite tool for doing some analysis or some statistic. Now, let's have a look at how that works. Now, I already uh, switched in this uh, demo recorded to the InView R. Now I am putting the data in uh, virtual reality, in, sorry, in 4D in this case, and it will take a, a while because I need to wear my Oculus and pick up my joystick. Now I'm in there, as you can see, and I'm sorry if I'm shaking a little bit, but uh, it's much better if you see it in VR than on a 2D screen. Now, the first things I want to do is try to enhance most of the foreground pixels. This is our probability map that we just generate. That means I can push up the level that I want to display it in here to be able to highlight these tiny structures. As soon as I've done that, I can just simply zoom in and start to look for one of those protrusions. Here I have something in front of my eyes. And as soon as I identified one of that, I just choose the right tool, tracking, create a new track. I will get a ball or a sphere that again I resize for the size of my structure. And by basically clicking, I will move over the time and I'm able to track the specific structure of interest. And if you look at my right joystick down here, you will see that these numbers are increasing. That means uh, we are moving along the time series. And you see how easy it is um, to, to see that structure and basically to be able to 
uh, track this protrusion that on a 2D screen will be extremely painful and also very complicated because you will have to continue rotate the image and here you don't need to rotate the image you can but you just can turn around the data you can look at the data now we have our track point here our segmented sphere and now i'm moving back in the time it's just to show you that uh, we have done a track in basically 30 seconds one minute I, I i i'm not sure about that but what you can do is soon as you are uh, happy with one track like in this case i'm thinking i'm kind of accurate save it first of all and then jump to the next one now i found another structure that is interesting in there and i just resize the sphere now it's a little bit smaller and you don't need uh, to track the entire time series but you can just choose to track a certain period for instance there is something that goes wrong in a certain time point like still there is a fluctuation in the intensity now what you can do is track until a specific point you will anyway con collect enough um, numbers to then do your statistic afterwards and you will repeat what i'm doing right now many many times and as i said this is uh, extremely useful uh, for this uh, specific case but also for other case uh, where you have difficult structure to track and where automatization can be very complicated of course, if you can automate it, that, that's super nice. But when you automate it, something you need also ground through. That means the VR itself will be also very useful to check our, or sorry, check how your automatization tracking and um, algorithm works and how accurate it is. And here you will see very, very nicely, directly. It's a visual uh, impact in there. Now I'm going out from the VR. I just did two tracks as an example for you and as you can see it was very very fast and now I want to switch back to uh, uh, Vision 4D uh, to show you also how you can visualize these tracks in there just give me a second because I'm putting down my oculus here you see already the track in XY this will be one of our track now I'm switching back to Vision 4D Vision 4D will start I aim to save it clearly um, and in a couple of seconds uh, we will have vision for the open that's great and here we go now uh, from the 2d i want to switch to the 4d viewer uh, and usually i prefer to visualize this data from uh, top because the 2pz resolution is kind of uh, very affected by the point spread function that sometimes can be very large now i want to push also my contrast because i want to see most of these details and basically here I have one track, as you can see, and the other one will be up here. There is a nice track editor that you can use also to visualize the tracks, and uh, you will find it here exactly under that. And here you can simply choose the track of interest and jump between the different time points. Okay, let's go for the next slide, sorry. Okay, well, tracking is not the only things that you can do in virtual reality or in Vision VR. Um, some other uh, tools that I use in the past, these they were not even in Vision VR, but I would say in the father of Vision VR, that is the InVR system, uh, was the previous name. Um, um, these are two applications that I found interesting. One is 3D nuclei segmentation. This is not something that you want to do for billions of nuclei, but you could do it or you could use it. Uh, if you want to generate ground through data for your network, neural network. Uh, if you are familiar with Stardist, you know that you need label image in there and raw data. And if you want to generate the label image uh, in v VR can make your life easier because it takes really few clicks. Do it that in lab kit can cost sometimes. Uh, another option is that you have already your automated algorithm for 3D nuclear segmentation uh, and you want to validate of course uh, the VR can help you in visualize this uh, uh, this data or how accurate it is your automatic automatization now the other example on the right is uh, tracing very manual tracing of axon this you will not do for a billions but also in this case if you have very few of them with a very complicated structure you can easily segment them as I'm doing in there 
And another um, possible application is that you have a tracing algorithm that works totally automated and you want just to validate or to check how this works. And in VR, as I already said, everything looks much, much easier to uh, understand than on a 2D screen. Now, I don't let this one running too long, but I mean, uh, you see, these are other possible applications that at least I had some user case where we applied this. Now, uh, second summary, um, tracking in uh, virtual reality allows to uh, quantify very complex dynamic. Um, um, also, virtual reality operation help to visualize and quantify very complicated process with high accuracy and with short amount of time. And with that, I would also add that it's also much fun. Uh, I mean, you can really interact with the data. Everything is much faster. That means you enjoy more to analyze manually the data. And in particular, when the complexity is very higher on, on a 2D screen, uh, the virtual reality helps a lot with that. Um, um, before that, I uh, go to the last slide. I think I wanted to show so something else. I just need to switch here back to Vision 4D. And what I would like to show you is also what you can do in terms of plotting of these tracks in Vision 4D or what you can export from Vision 4D in terms of numbers. Now I just open a new viewer and I just need to get one project that I already created before for you. I'm loading the project. I will just choose exactly what I have been tracking in VR. Here we go. I will just make this one larger and then we can maybe have a split viewer and we put this one in 4D. Oops. Okay, as I did before, I just turn it and I will adjust my contrast to see a little bit better this. Now I show you the track editor that is this, right? That's pretty powerful. You will have a long list of tracks uh, if you do many of them. What you have also is the object table. And in this object table, what you can find are basically your object that you place and to which track they are belonging and the track itself. And of course, if you want to have a quick look at some of this information, what you can just do is simply plot this information here. Now we plot the in Y, the uh, center with the speed. That doesn't make too much sense. According to me, what I could plot is the Y center of the geometry, the center of mass. And I can also plot here the X. And now at the corner, you will see your tracks. You can simply select them and they will appear in the table up there as you can see you can also show them for the time point that you are looking that means i have two tracks i have um two uh, object detected and also if you want then to do some post-processing somewhere else what you can go in, in the feature columns here and here you can choose what you want to export. And you have many, many features, not only about the object, but also about the tracks, like velocity is something that usually people are very interested in, and they're also very interested, or the track length. Let me see, you already obtain all of that. And as I said, if you don't want to do it in here, you can, or if you are limited for some uh, specific task in Vision 4D, you can just go here, export as Excel, and you will generate an Excel file that you can post-process afterwards. Uh, about coloring and visualized tracks, you have many tools. You can use opacity for your spot. Um, you can uh, color the track uh, by uh, the track ID itself. That means they will have all the same color over the time. You can use a random color. You can use store color. You can choose the color of interest. And one of the nice features is also uh, that sometimes people are asking uh, that you can color the tracks according to the speed. For instance, you want to have a color code in your uh, tracks, you can just choose in this table what you want to color code according to what, like the speed. And then if you will do auto, you will be able to color code your tracks according to the speed in there. And I think if I zoom in, you should see that.
going back to here. Okay. This we have already went through. Okay. Uh, well, what is the workflow that I just present is basically we are interested in studying these neuronal stem cell dynamics. Uh, what we apply in our workflow is image restoration uh, to keep low phototoxicity and higher temporary solution by using the Enhanced AI. We then use the Arivis Vision for the machine learning operator to additionally enhance the structure of interest and reduce the background. And in the end, what we did is to track in 3D in uh, virtual reality using Vision VR. Um, I spoke about additional material. Uh, here you find a link to Elastic. If you are interested, you can just click here. You can read the documentation. It's very well documented. Uh, you can download the software and try it by yourself. I suggest you to do it. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a very powerful software. If you are interested in more methods for, in general, image segmentation or image processing, uh, the new Bias Academy is doing a great job in the last uh, five months uh, from the beginnings of this corona time. And there you can find many lectures that have been recorded on YouTube. And here you can really follow uh, many interesting uh, or get to know many interesting tools. And of course, if you are interested in reading a little bit more about how these Enhanced AI work or in general the AI part in uh, um, this Nikon software, you can just look at this link. With that, I come to my final slide about the acknowledgement. Um, Varun and Elena, that they, I mean, Varun initiated the project and Elena helped a lot with the tracking in virtual reality and she did it in a very smart way because she just needed a few minutes of introduction and she was completely independent. Uh, Frank and Thomas, that they are supporting the project and Thomas and Rini in particular, that they are basically uh, supporting my position. Of course, the Arivis team, Maria, David, Tamara and Christoph, and uh, Simone Lepper from the Nikon team to let us uh, test the Enhanced AI and I think we did a great job in there. Uh, thank you for your attention and if you have any further question, I will be very happy to answer it. Thank you. Hi, Carlo. Um, very nice uh, webinar. Uh, I, I, I love how you use all the latest technology in terms of machine learning and, and VR, right? Yeah. Um, I have a question. So regarding sure. the machine learning, um, what drive you to choose machine learning versus just more... Um, like a subtraction uh, and... Yes, or, or typical thresholding. Is that because it was just easier to set up the analysis in this way or or it, just, it was just giving you much better results with the segmentation, both? I mean, in general, it's both. Uh, mm. I mean, machine learning at our day, in particular, these pixel classification mm. methods are super easy to use. I mean, and you don't need to play too much around. Basically, you just add labels and you choose certain mm. features and the classifier learns by itself. The other reason is also because we didn't want just to subtract uh, the background, but also try to enhance further this uh, uh, tiny structure. And in mm -hmm. that, the machine learning gave us a little bit of enhancing or additionally of enhancing that we could then benefit in, uh, uh, um, in virtual reality for the tracking. These, I would say, are the two main reasons why I, I choose the machine learning. I'm also a very big fan of the machine learning, most probably. Uh, there will be also other systems that you can apply, I'm, I'm totally sure, but this worked mm -hmm. very well and was set it up in, I mean, half a day. <laughs> that means it was very mm -hmm. convenient for us. Is that something, because of course, um, for sure, the manual tracking cannot be automated, um, but is that, for example, the um, artificial intelligence pre-processing or, or the machine learning, is that something that it can be batch processed over uh, different data sets or... Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. I mean, the idea is that you do the training once. I mean, you take mm -hmm. one of your data set. Let's say I take this, uh, uh, I take one Z stack. It's easier. Let's forget about the time dimension. I do there the training. Okay, how I would know if the training is good enough. 
to apply to another data set. Well, I open another data set that has never been seen by the classifier and I look at the prediction. I don't do any training. I just uh, look at the prediction. Mm -hmm. In this case, if I see that mm, the training is not, uh, sorry, the prediction is not brilliant, I will train more in there. Then I open a third stack and okay, I see, works perfectly. I go for batch processing okay. and I apply the, 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 the training that I did on mm -hmm. all my images. This you can do it in uh, Vision 4D, you can do it in Elastic, it's, it's, uh, it's very convenient. Of course, uh, you have to provide images that they are acquired with a certain similarity. I mean, if yeah. you have two images that they are totally different, I will mm -hmm. train two different classifiers, like mm -hmm. two different projects, one for one type of image and the other one for another type of image. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very nice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Do we and have then yeah. Perhaps I sure. ask something else. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. And then, um, so of course, also quite it simplifies a lot the tracking to be able to do it in VR versus um, manual tracking within the to the computer. I mean, because on, um, yeah. I, I realized that uh, tracking this kind of protrusions is always is something that um, many researchers are interested in doing, and it's something very tricky to do. Yes. which means that at the end you are limited to to manual tracking so yeah. Yeah. i yes. mean the manual sometimes uh, uh manual makes always sense because you have always any way to validate whatever you do automatically mm -hmm. that means you need a ground through in general uh of course doing it on a screen it's in 3d is very very tedious you have to continue to rotate and you don't have even the perception that's that's what makes me mm -hmm. Uh, uh, a fan of the VR for this uh, application because you are really sitting on your projection. You can really turn around and look at it from different perspective in a very quick way. Um, most probably this recorded demo doesn't really um, give the total feeling that you have. If you put the Oculus mm -hmm. on yourself, it's, it's, it's another environment. Of course, here we are bound to, uh, uh, to yeah. a screen. We should have a cave. Maybe next time we can do it in a cave. That would be very, very <laughs> interesting to see how others see this from a different perspective. Um, but yeah, I mean, I I'm, I'm totally agree with you. What we did uh, as a um, uh, comparison is to um, make of this maximum intensity projection and do manual tracking uh, in uh, Fiji, basically using mm -hmm. the TrackMate plugin to see how far we were between 3D and 2D. And for certain cases, the 3D brings you, I mean, more close to what the data shows. That means they are, it's, you are more precise in there. And also another thing that I found very nice uh, for the manual part in here and do it in VR instead of on the screen, that you have a better idea what is on the top and the bottom of your stack. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes these this guys, they go out from the field of view because you acquire mm -hmm. a certain volume. And this can also, uh, let's say, bias your, your, your analysis because maybe you are thinking there is a retraction, but this guy is still elongating. It's just simply out of your field of view. And there you, you, you avoid immediately uh, those. Uh, structure and you don't need any image segmentation. I mean, you just do it on the raw mm -hmm. data or the enhanced AI data or the machine learning data, then it depends really a lot on the data. These data, as I said, they were kind of difficult. I mean, in particular, before that we were applying the enhanced AI, I was really, um, uh, we can make something out of that. And it seems that we can, and the tools are out of there. It's a, the matter to, to put them together and build up the workflow. Mm, very nice. Thank so you. that means that it's a lot of fun to work in the lab, yeah? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have this this project, it's always uh, you you have to think a lot and and explore tools and uh, takes time. But I think it's uh, it's nice to have a uh, 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 kind of variability in the projects that we are following. And here there is a lot of variability. I mean, we go mm -hmm. from everything. <laughs> Yeah, very nice. It's just it is super nice to see how you are making the most out of all, all the latest technologies for for image analysis, right? From machine learning, from combining open source to commercial software to also VR. So really nice, very nice thank work. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's mm -hmm. a, thank you. Thanks a lot. Do we have other questions? Currently, there are none. 
Um, so I think we're probably going to uh, call it a day. Um, I want to once again very much uh, second what Delisa said and thank you ever so much uh, for your uh, input here, uh, for your presentation. It's always great to see what uh, people are doing with our software and the creative ways in which uh, the, the, it's used to solve problems. Uh, so thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Thank you. We're going to hang around for a couple more minutes in case uh, anybody do does have any other questions. Uh, mm -hmm. But if not, uh, well, uh, thank you everyone for attending and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. And if you have other questions, just, uh, just let me know. Thank you. Uh, by the way, is, is there a... Um, do you, do you have your email address if people want to contact you? I know you're happy for them to contact you on there. If, uh... um, can we? How can we share that? I mean, I, I will be very well, happy. I, if I don't someone... know. You, you, could, you could just type it in your PowerPoint presentation. But I, I think everybody's going anyway. Uh, let me remember, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, um, let's, let's double check because... Uh, <laughs> I, I don't write to myself usually, and I never remember the. It's it's also a very simple one, and uh, I don't know why I don't. Uh, here it is. Uh, uh, Heidelberg is not uppercase. It's just Heidelberg. T. That's it's my uh, email address. If someone has questions or uh, wants to know. Uh, more you can just write me an email and All right. i think it's lowercase uh i'm not I, I don't think we're gonna get any more questions so once more thank you and uh goodbye everyone and we'll see you next time goodbye bye, -bye.